Hey y'all. Hi. So I smile, but but and and and, and, and look at you with that facilitation. That's an <laughs> expertise right there. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta find the joy. If not in the struggle, then surrounding it, outside of it, you gotta find it somewhere. There is a lot of struggle, so a lot of perhaps struggle. a lot of joy? I don't know. I haven't found it yet, but this is a week. Is we a are week? here. Um, I'm excited to talk to y'all. This has been one of the things I've been looking forward to. Um, I typically ask, how are you doing? Um, Maybe I can ask, how are you arriving? And then hand it to you, Sandra. So I'm arriving a little tired, but excited to talk to y'all. I am arriving in one of my two power colors, red. And then as you may have noticed, if you watch us, the other power color is my favorite neutral, leopard. Yes, you did teach me that leopard was a neutral and I'm very glad to know it. Besides cutie glasses, how are you arriving, Tanya? Yeah, I'm arriving also in my favorite color, which is, I feel to be plum. Yes. My boss yes. likes to argue with me and call it Bordeaux. She yes. tries to be fancy. <laughs> She's more <laughs> fancy than I am, but. Um, and then I, this is a tough week for me personally, as well as socially what's going on in America, um, but I'm in relatively good spirits. So, yeah. well, and it's mainly, and I told you guys because Obi-Wan Kenobi was amazing in a finale. That's one thing that I do to kind of lift up my spirits. I watch Marvel, I watch Star Wars, or I read um, fantasy um, novels or mysteries. So immediately this week, Obi-Wan was something I was looking forward to and it did not disappoint. So thank you, Ewan McGregor, um, Disney Plus, whoever put it together. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Obi-Wan was so good. I actually wore a shirt for you, Sarnia. <laughs> <laughs> Obi-Wan was so good. Um, yeah, I just, I loved it. Um, I've been watching The Floor is Lava. Um, it's so pointless and I love it so much. Um, but yeah, that's where I've been at. Sandra, I think you have a link for us. Yeah, I just wanted to share a couple of resources. I know it's a really um, hard time for all of us, for many of us, um, with Roe v. Wade being overturned. I just wanted to share a couple of resources. I know it can be a time where it can really be easy to fall into hopelessness. And it's also totally okay to feel despair, sadness, what have you. What I feel really great about is that there are so many brilliant people who have been preparing for this moment and have resources available for folks who need it. So if you would like to donate, connect to a local abortion fund and or access services for yourself or a loved one, you can visit abortionfunds.org that is the National Network of Abortion Funds. They will also connect you with a local fund. Stay involved. And also if you need help, they're there to help you. And they're the experts at it. So no need to like start something new. These folks are already doing it, get involved with them. There's also the Repro Legal Defense Fund. These are who you might wanna contact if you get into legal trouble trying to terminate a pregnancy yourself or supporting others. And they will also help you as well. And that's what I have. There are lots of wonderful people helping. Those are two of my favorite groups. And I will make sure that those go into the description. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the daytime Emmys. Let's <laughs> talk about the Emmys. Uh, I loved it. So first of all, I was really salty that I found it because you know, we're all West Coasters. And so I didn't realize that they were like not gonna air live on the West Coast. Come on. They're in California. They were in Pasadena. The disrespect. 
Um, so shout out to Susie, shout out to Discord for letting us experience it live. And so fun to like be watching it with other GH fans, um, like a virtual watch party, enjoying people's outfits, enjoying um, our show. Um, one thing about GH, I feel like I can talk about GH because it's my show, but if other people do, I'm like, hold up. <laughs> Don't you talk about my show. Um, but yeah, we have some really big wins. Yeah, really great wins. I was super excited for Michelle Morgan. Yeah. I've been watching her for a long time. I mean, when she like it, she didn't get nominated. I don't think she got nominated for when she was playing Hillary and when Hillary died and was having, you know, that was a super, super emotional heavyweight performance that she gave. And naturally, you know, the producers in the show realized what they lost and they brought her back. Totally different character, but she experienced, again, another heavy hitting storyline. And the scenes that she gave was real, that she submitted really kind of showcased that. And so I'm so glad that she was recognized for that work because she's amazing. And just, uh, again, the import, which I didn't realize, but of course, you know, we, we, we always try to promote, but the import of her being the first Black woman in this category was even more amazing. I shouted three times. I, didn't, I wasn't able to watch on Friday night. I had to watch the next day or, yeah, later. But I shouted three times, and that one was one where I was just like, yes. So... Congratulations, Michelle. I'm so, so excited and happy for you and you deserve it. Yes. I don't watch Young and the Restless. I have no context, but I was like, oh, this is the only Black woman who was like nominated in this category this year. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that she was the first Black woman to win. The yeah. fact that we're having first in 2022, yeah. the fact that Victoria Rawlings has never won. Right? That like Miss mm, Dimples herself, like of Angie and Jesse, Debbie Moore, the right. Debbie Morgan has never won. Just I'm like, wow, wow. Yeah. But um, so I don't really know much about her, but I was like going back to like our episode where we talked about the Indies, and I was like, I remember saying, Oh yeah, I want her to win. <laughs> I'm running for everybody black, and I have no qualms mm -hmm. about that. Um, so it was like, I mean, like everybody looked great. Um, Laura looked great. Laura Wright looked great. Cynthia Watros looked great. I'm glad they got like some pictures together so people can stop with like the real life rivalry. Such a weird thing to do. It's so clear that these women like love each other, support each other. Um, but yeah, they looked great, but I was in GH is my show, but mm, I was so happy to see, see her win. Yeah. And GH won in so many other acting categories that I'm just like, there's plenty of joy and honors for everyone to go around. Yeah. Let's talk about our child winning. Let's just like, let's get to it, okay? Okay, but I, I, I do want to say I had some heart um, hot takes on the show. Some of them were a little snarky, but yeah, we <laughs> definitely could talk about Yay, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, you know, it was like one of those things, because um, I actually want to talk about this category too, but it was one of those things that was like, it, you really couldn't go wrong. Um, all, I don't watch the y &R, but I do watch Days, and so I know the um, young woman who plays Allie is very talented, and then like we had three in, of like, our kids in this category. Sydney Michaela on that red carpet. Ah! I said, would they let her get grown? Oh my God. <laughs> but she, she just looked amazing, worked it. William Lifton is such, I don't know, like it's so hard to think that you don't know them because they seem so sweet and so genuine. Yeah. And Nicholas Chavez is so um, earnest. It's hard not to root for Spencer because Nicholas Chavez is so good. Um, and just like his emotions for winning, I was like, I really hope he never loses that like humility 
in that because he's going to go far. This is one of many, many awards that he's going to win. Um, but, you know, his portrayal of Spencer Cassidine, I'm going to just say is like the best recast I've ever seen. Yes. That feels easy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and he's just that good. And they've given him so, they gave him really great material to work with. I know from his reel, he talked about um, the, the, the scene at the gallery where he like renounced his, his name. Um, I think he like d- gave some stuff with Mora. Like he is able to work with such powerhouses and still give powerhouse performances. He doesn't get overshadowed. That says so much. And then to see the rest of the cast um, there's like a picture of him hugging his brother and there's like Laura Wright and Panola in the background just looking thrilled and like Sydney and William just like standing that cameraman who took away our Sydney and Nicholas hug mm, we waiting for you too soon cut away too soon cut away too soon I'm gonna stop talking I can guess forever how did y'all feel about it oh my god I mean I felt like I was legit like watching like my godson out at a school play. Like I was just like, oh my God, my baby. Every time I saw any post where it was especially like showing pictures of him and how like how uh, moved he was or like any of the videos of him, like my immediate response, no filter was my baby. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, everything that you said about both just his talent, how talented he is, how humble he is, and yet still like very confident performer. Um, We're so lucky to uh, have welcomed him to the GH family. And I, and I also just want to know, this kid had five months of real to work with, not a year five months because we're actually coming up on his one year anniversary next week so I also think that's phenomenal for a young person to come in and and honestly the category was very competitive this year so because you know I didn't the it sounds like the scenes that I didn't see that were submitted for the other actors on um, days, I wasn't watching during Allie's storyline that she submitted during, but both of the, of the young women from the, from the NBC and CBS soaps um, sounded like they had really amazing reels as well. And so I think it also just speaks to like the young people on daytime and how wonderful it is to have so many amazing talented folks and we just happen to have (laughs) you know the best of the very best and there aren't a lot of things that oftentimes I'll brag about (laughs) about GH right now but I will brag on these young folks and I will brag on Nicholas Chavez who's amazing yeah yeah I mean you guys said it all Basically, I don't have to even add anything else. I think, um, except to say, I screamed for three people. I screamed for Michelle, I screamed for Jeff, and I screamed for Nicholas because they were all so deserving. And I'm so happy. And like you said, this is going to be the first of many for, you know, Nicholas. I think, I don't know, you always kind of joke that, you know, we're not going to have him long. that's definitely a possibility now. I mean, folks are going to be looking at him a lot closely, um, but I hope that he's, he stays with us for a a good amount of time where we can have some real great um, Spencer Cassidine scenes because um, he's amazing and he's amazing at it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope they give him the material that, I mean, they know he can do anything. Mm -hmm. And as Sandra pointed out, like to give him, I mean, he got heavy stuff in that five months. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like some of the heaviest of anybody. um, And he delivered um, every single time. I'll say that, like, I think that category is really interesting because there's like so much, like there's been a lot of conversation about it. And so they asked him several times on the carpet 
about the category where they were like, so it used to be broken into like, um, man, like young man, young woman, or male, young female, whatever. Um, and so they've recently collapsed it. There, there's been two before him, um, and they both have been actresses. And so he's the first actor to win. And now they are like slowly um, changing the age of the performer. So it used to be like 25 and under, now it's 21. And then I think in 2023, it's gonna be 18 and under. So the most winningest and uh, most nominated person in that category has been Jonathan Jackson. Mm -hmm. Also from GH. Um, and I think Nicholas actually won't be able to submit in this category next year. So he'll be bumped up to supporting um, when he, or supporting your leader, whatever he chooses to submit when he submits again. Um, and so on the carpet, they were asking him a lot about this gender breakdown. And I appreciated that he was like, listen, I don't know nothing about that. <laughs> he was just like, I'm an actor, I'm an actor, as you can tell, look at my award. Um, but I thought it was really interesting that they asked him, they can, they asked him, I saw at least three times they asked him about the gender stuff, but nobody asked him about age. Right. I'm like, what are y'all trying to do here? Leave my child alone. Don't we try to trap him in questions? Yeah. It, the fixation is so strange. I know Sydney got asked it. I feel like it's Michael Fairman who keeps asking about it, to be honest, because mm. I think he, he was the one that asked Sydney about it in her interview after she was nominated. And so I appreciated both Sydney and Nicholas's responses, which were very different. Sydney was like, well, you know, I, I know a lot of they them, so mm. makes sense to me. Seems like this is what we're going to be doing moving forward. This is the future. And I loved Nicholas's response, which was like, I'm far too ignorant about this subject to have an opinion, which I really think that more like young men and masculine folks could learn from that response. And not even just young men, old men actually, probably more than anyone. Um, it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to have an opinion about something that you haven't like thoroughly educated yourself on and so I appreciated his response and I do think it's very strange that they keep fixating on this and I'm pretty sure the category actually used to be combined in the past I could mm. be wrong about that but I'm pretty sure that the it wasn't always separate um so I think we're kind of like spinning this to be this like new scary uh, trans panic moment quite frankly um when really it's like uh, it's it's just a combined category and I think it's really interesting that they keep emphasizing like oh well isn't it great that a man like a man finally won this category um so are y'all just saying that like the male actors can't compete with the women because well. I I actually do agree with that um, in general, generally speaking, and this is not about the younger actors, this is actually about the supporting and especially the lead categories. I think there's a really big difference between in, in the talent in both those categories and like the competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I also say, and I'm sorry, Tanya, I, was, I don't know if you had something. Um, go, no, actually, as a matter of fact, go ahead. I feel like I can gush about Nicholas and talk about this category forever. So please. I don't <laughs> have anything to add. <laughs> yeah. um, I just, I think that it's also really interesting with like what this category means and the competitive competitiveness of it. Um, so like, I, I, I wonder what it means um, in the context of like all the people who have won it before and who was able to win more. So I think, when it goes down to 18 it makes sense that like um it's combined and it's like you got one winner I wonder if it me make, would make sense to have two winners I wonder like what would make sense to make it a little bit more um fair and like on par with like how people have been able to like win before and I also wonder about what it means for like younger actors who have to compete with older actors because I do think that there's like a difference between William Lipton having to like compete with JPS 
and like I love William obviously um but I just I wonder like what that means for the category and what it means for like the ability for younger folks um not with not with gender but with age being able to like um compete in the categories in like a fair way um and that's like something I've been thinking about especially as we talk about age yeah and I well for me I'm like why is JPS in a supporting actor category in the first place (laughs) Because he ch- he chose to submit a supporting. Oh, well, supporting. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's the hard part. I think lead actor supporting it's it's in those are interesting categories to have, especially um, there's so many, you know, very talented. There's more seasoned actors, but having them as supporting doesn't necessarily always make sense to me. Um, but yeah, totally understand that the, the youth and the age and the experience sometimes, um, that makes the categories be unfair when you're having people of different experience levels. Mm -hmm. I also wonder like how many are, how many active actors 18 and under are there with like current storylines on any of the groups? I mean, I know certainly there aren't any on GH that have like storylines. No. And I think probably the most active young actor on the show would be Hudson. Leo? Oh. Leo. Yeah, Leo. Uh, the actor that plays Leo. Uh, I can't remember his name right now. Um, and then yeah, Hudson. They used so. to be Charlotte, and now Charlotte's gone. Right. Um, and now mm-hmm. they're promoting um, Violet. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. yeah. So. Poor Sophia, her shoulders have to hurt carrying all these grown ass men. <laughs> Let's move to the other category that made you uh, yell, Tanya, mm-hmm. which was a uh, best supporting actor. You yelled. Sandra's BFF. <laughs> My bestie Jeff Kober. Yeah. I, you know, I I, I want to not talk as much about this because um he's my choice for the week. So and that's why I really screamed because I was so moved by his performance this week that I was yeah. like, this is so deserved. And, yeah. you know, not only just this week, but, you know, in the past, he has done some great performances and very much deserved um, the, the award. I, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. nothing more I can say. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, Jeff Cober. Jeff Cober. He's just wonderful. He's, he's been... Him, I mean, obviously him and Michael E. Knight both have been like the best surprise family members um, of anyone in Port Charles in, I would say, a decade. (laughs) Like, they're so wonderful. He's so talented. We were so lucky to have him when we did. I, and when, and we'll talk about this later, but like I already when with his scene in the 15,000th episode with Jeannie, I was like, well, I guess Jeff's ready for his guest Emmy now. Um, he'll be fighting it out with Katie McLean <laughs> for her recent guest stint on um, Days. And yeah, he's such, He's so wonderful. I I just pray for another Cyrus resurgence. You know how I feel about him. He's just yeah. he's a phenomenal actor. He's so nuanced. And I, what I love is just like the kind of colors and textures he brings to like this character where he is, you actually never know. Like I, there's, it's hard for me to hate Cyrus. Like I just don't. He's a mess. He's like going up against my fave, AKA <laughs> Trina. But there's like some some like a humanity there that he continues to bring out, even though he's a mess. Um, and I and what I like about Cyrus that we don't do enough with villains is rest them. Yes, because it is really hard when you have people that good to get them like in stories, right? Like you want to make sure that they're around and they kind of like are they belong to the show. Um, and if you don't, people who are that talented end up getting other work and can't come back as much as, as much as you want them to. 
Um, but have but the the fact that we're able to rest him and that he's not just like out all the time just being wild is why that character works. And so I think that sometimes even I will ask, damn, I really wish we had more of him. I think we have, I mean, a little bit more will be fine. Mm-hmm. But I think we have a good amount of him that makes him someone that we miss and someone that we enjoy seeing when he comes back around. Yeah. I would love to see this. I would love to see Cyrus um, and Spencer and Trina in a little storyline. Oh, I would love it so much. I need it. <laughs> I need it so bad. Oh, just like all my faves. Just <laughs> the Laura, throw a little Victor in there. Ooh a little mora in there just we got we have it storyboarded for you gh we're ready <laughs> when you are um text yeah me, Frank. text yeah i hear you love texting um and let me tell you i'm a really good texter uh but yeah i think <laughs> <laughs> text me <laughs> <laughs> jeff um <laughs> the, the balance that they successfully struck with Cyrus was I you were really honestly left wanting more and that's yeah. very rare on a GH villain and really so villains in general so yeah good on him good on GH uh-huh. we can say good on you when you do right things okay. but and I that is also part of like I think <laughs> why when gh won for best drama at least some of the fan fan conversations that i was a part of people were like the fuck (laughs) (laughs) so here is my hot take i had two hot takes i was like dude why is gh sweeping all the acting awards yay and then i was like Oh, days wins for writing. Well, that's not shocking. So I was like, wait. So mm-hmm. you guys talk about this all the time. You guys say GH has the best actors, but we always comment on the fact that the writing is just so, uh, and it showed with the awards. And the funny thing is, is that I have been looking at the ratings consistently and you know, YNR, Bold and the Beautiful, and sometimes Days, always best in the ratings, right? And so we have the we have the best actors and they're doing some really great work, but y'all, the writers, I was surprised at the directing um, <laughs> award too, but I wasn't surprised at the acting. It was just like, I was surprised at the best and then the, yeah, the directing. That was- yeah interesting to me yeah one of the things I oh go ahead Sergio. oh no you go ahead uh, well it was actually something I was talking about with you which is that I think that really depends on like what reel um yeah is submitted and so like one of the things I was like noting to Sandra was like I've been like looking at some of the stuff around like the primetime Emmys because I really am interested in like what happens with this is us and what happens with Bridgerton um, and so Justin Hartley, who plays Kevin on This Is Us, um, has never been nominated for This Is Us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like, I don't know if you watched this, the show, but like mm-hmm. this current season was really a Kevin season. Mm-hmm. Like other seasons have really been about Randall, but this is a Kevin season. Right. And he's still submitted for supporting. Um, and I think it's because he thinks he has a better chance of like getting nominated and winning for supporting. And I think that also the Academy had a better chance of actually watching all of this stuff. Just like with like um, big awards, like the Oscars, people have had a better chance of watching the full movie and not just like the package product that people put together. Whereas so with daytime, it's, you know, 200 and whatever amount of days a year uh, or that many episodes it's hard for people to watch outside of what is submitted on the reel. And so if you looked at like the GH reel, you would have, they talked about race because <laughs> they had like the, the story with Jordan and Cameron. Mm-hmm. Um, then like you would have thought the sex tape story was like actually moving along because they had like a little bit of that. 
And so they were, they've done a, they did a really good job of packaging drama. I was like, damn, this is good. When I saw like the real, like they had like Carly walking in on um, Sunny and um, Mina in bed. Like they had all of these like really great moments. I will say that they did not use some of the best characters. I think that people love, I love, I am people seeing the vets. And so like not having more vets in the real didn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, but the way it was packaged, it did look like family. It did look like a lot of the things that we complain about. And so you can't tell the, the things that we complain about the most from a reel. Right. That's what I would think. And there was probably, there was certainly even more to the reel than what they showed in mm-hmm. the categories. Cause like, I think reels can be, or at least I know the acting reels can be like nine minutes or something like that. I'm sure the show reels are probably similar. And I think for the directing reel, they won for, they submitted Nancy's standalone episode, which Mm -hmm. the direction was very good in that. And I think my reflections on, and this is very kind of along the line of what you were saying, Tracy, is that also it, it's about being able to package the reel. And I think it's also that GH can be phenomenal. It can be excellent. It has many excellent moments when they're writing for like actors the way that they need to, when they're writing for the characters the way they need to, when they're really heightening the drama the way they need to. They're just really inconsistent. And thankfully a reel doesn't capture when you're being inconsistent. It's about highlighting your strengths. And so GH has so many strengths. It makes sense to me why they would um, win best show when you look at it from that perspective. Um, but it is frustrating um, because you know you can they can be better. So it's like, okay, like we know, like it's just it's sort of how I felt about some of the episodes this week where I'm just like, this was good. Where you been? Why isn't it like this? It doesn't even have to be like this all the time, but can it be like this 50% more? <laughs> That's all that I uh-huh. ask. So yeah, like great job packaging, great job having the great moments. Can we like make that more consistent? Thank you. Please. I, my only <laughs> comment is for the Emmys, I wish that we were able to see the scenes more. Because there's like some, like you guys, you guys don't watch some of the shows. And so you may wondering, okay, so why, why did this actor win above my favorite actor? Cause it's all, and sometimes when, like in the past, if I've seen the reels that they submitted or the scenes they submitted, then I'd be like, oh yeah, that was really good. They should win. You know? <laughs> so then I, then I'm not like begrudging it so much. Um, and then also I kind of want the world to see how awesome Nicholas is if they haven't, if they don't watch the show, I want them to see that when he renounced his Cassidy name, that was just like, oh my God, I'm crying with you right now. Cause this was horrible. So I, that, you know, I really, it seemed like they only show for directing and I guess lead actor and actress. And I was like, <laughs> You know, these supporting actors do great too. You know, the younger actors do awesome. They did deserve to have their reel shown. And so next year, Emmys, if you do, if we get to see this on television, which I have to say, I'm glad to be able to see it on television for, for a while. We we did not get to be able to see it. And sometimes, um, so yeah. great to see we're, this. Yeah, they weren't really doing in person. They were doing like. Yeah, they're doing it online. Red carpet and then. Yeah, and then that's it. So I'm happy. Thank you, CBS, for sharing and sharing the show with us. Um, But again, let's get back to the way it used to be so we can see the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. The other winner uh, from GHA that we didn't talk about uh, was Kelly T Mm -hmm. um, for Best Supporting. Um, And I, at first, I was really cynical. I was like, oh. What did she do to so, um, submit her like crying about Jason? But then uh, Sandra checked me and was like, no, it's probably the Huntington thing. So I was like, oh, that one's really good. Probably what? <laughs> you, you said what? I said it's, pro- it's probably the Huntington's was, yeah. her, was her reel, which she did really great work on. She did do really great work on that. So yeah. congratulations, Kelly. 
Um, I was, yeah, I will always love your storyline. You are very talented. Yes. And I, I was also a little cynical because she was up against Kimberly Brown, who on, you know, Bold and Beautiful, oh my goodness. But that Huntington scenes were great. And yes, congratulations. And, you know, I don't know. She seems really sweet on social media. I don't know what her background is, but she seems really sweet and genuine. So I'm, I'm happy for her. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little goofy girl from Texas. Right. <laughs> I get it. Um, and I think, I think Kimberly will win next year. Yeah. Because I think a lot of her, I mean, the fact that she was even nominated because she really only came on the, sh- like, what, the last few months of the year? Mm-hmm. So that speaks for a lot. And it seems like a lot of her, like, meaty stuff, at least as, like, a non-viewer who, like, receives the commentary, it seems like it was this calendar year so good luck to everyone in supporting after <laughs> next year because hey i don't even watch that show and kimberly versus nicholas though that's gonna be hard if no nicholas- they, they separate those by tinder oh they do that's right okay <laughs> i was like oh my god if he has to go up against but he's done really great work but Whew. okay no, yeah. he'll be going up against men, so he'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sorry. I'm just trying to get some more comments on YouTube about how much we hate men. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. You know, just trolling. <laughs> and I mean it. Oh, yeah. Bright and James has done some great work this year, but I don't think it... I don't know. He's be- getting more and more handsome as the years go on. For real. How? Bright and... My thirst for Greg Vaughn, my lord. I know you <laughs> like mm, fine wine. Finest. That picture of Greg Vaughn and Deirdre. Ooh. Talk about two of fine wines. Right? Just a tasting. Why is Deirdre Hall so beautiful still? I am confused. <laughs> like some i hope she probably drinks a lot of water got to and buys her business a lot right i don't know anything else about her other than she's on this show Mm -hmm. and you know what i love that yes i love that her (laughs) soap star most of the time i don't want to know (laughs) i don't like to look too close at anybody i like i'm just like "Mm -mm, don't please don't tell me right Stay off social media and don't and nobody tell me. Don't tell me. Thank you. I will say I did enjoy the show. Seeing Susan Susan Lucci was like really amazing. Of uh, her um the randoms like so emotional. Um I was not a super fan of Michael Bolton. I'm not gonna lie to you about that. Um <laughs> Here's my, that was my snarky comment though. So I was like, I said, he doesn't look strong enough to carry his voice. That's what I said. But his voice is so amazing. His music is so amazing. But that was, that was my comment. <laughs> and the thing is, like, they, did the, um, they did the Cupid show with um, the girl Zoe Deschanel. Mm-hmm. And he was great on there. I loved having him on that show. His personality was popping. He seemed really animated. He was singing his ass off. He was funny. But for tonight, it was like, I don't know what was going on. Or that Emmy night. I was like. (sighs) Well, the song he did sing was my song. I do still love that song. It is Kelly and Zach's breakup song from Saved by the Bell. I told everyone about it. Jesse and Slater sang it. Um, I still get emotional thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and Kelly dumped Zach for that not that no good older dude. Um, to that song. And can we say, oh my God, Betty, hilarious! This one, oh, she's so missed. That one little seed, that one little clip of her accepting an award was just amazing and hilarious 
They were like, let's end on Betty. Yeah. And let's I was on Betty because this reel is long. Mm-hmm. Ugh, yeah. So sad. It's and very sad how long very it Very long and very sad. And I feel like it was like, I, you know, obviously we want to honor mm-hmm. our folks. And so that was just, maybe that was also part of like Michael's, if he was a little low energy, was just like, this is heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I, I felt like kind of torn about that segment. It's like, this is necessary and doom. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm glad they ended on Betty because it's like, you can't help but smile and mm-hmm. be sad, of course, but also like she just brought so much joy and happiness to people. And right. It was nice yeah. to end on her. And it was great to see Susan because let me tell you, she looks the exact same as when AMC went off the air. It's crazy to me. Yeah. And she looked the same for like a good solid decade, you know, like leading up to that. I'm just like, Susan's minding her business and staying hydrated. <laughs> Gotta be it. Using that oil of Olay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure. Right. Sure so and male tears mixes it mm. I like to spray <laughs> them with like I a high get that. I like want, rose I, water and male tears really I need some of that in my life <laughs> I mean your skin's already popping Tanya but let me tell you a little male tears will really mm-hmm. get to the next level that's the fountain of youth right there right <laughs> <laughs> So I, that's why I want to get some of that a little early so I can have it, the foundation. Yes. It's never too early to start your, <laughs> your skin regimen. Yeah. Well, is there anything that we're missing in our Emmys roundup? That's all I had in my mind. Oh, I just want to say, yeah, I did say best speech besides Michelle was executive director of Turn the Table with Robin Roberts. Man, she represented Afro-Latina. I was like, go girl. Yeah. I love that. Yes. I love that. Yeah, <laughs> she did. Mm-hmm. Michelle's speech, oh, so good. Mm-hmm. So good. And I think I saw um, uh, Marcy Miller like um, mouthing like she deserved it or something yeah. like that which is really cool like to see someone to win and to like also be so respected in your category like speaks volumes mm-hmm. um, and I also saw that Victoria Rowling had like tweeted about her um, it, yeah it's just like a, a huge moment um, and Tara from Port Misery um, have recorded a podcast about it she's been like putting them out I'm like that is her Okay. Um, but she was like talking about how that opens up and it really does it opens up for other black women other women of color to like mm-hmm. get story because like we are we are capable and ready to be award winning um, and there's the talent is there so like let's get that right in here too <laughs> and it all doesn't have to be DNA scandals that white DNA skin doesn't have to always be that right sometimes you know who the daddy is there are other (laughs) storylines for black women um Frank text us we have some ideas Frank I feel like now we need like a text line to give yeah we just get a google a google voice (laughs) like number you this is a direct line Frank from you to GH Sunday shift, we got you. I mean, we do, we'll, there will be a very high consulting fee, but we got you. We got you. We're well, giving you some top lines for free. We do need to be able to be a guest on the show. Well, yes, I will be playing Nicholas Castain. That is part of the design. <laughs> and, you know, I will I be want- love interest for Dante. I will be shady black extra at the Savoy because they always come through. <laughs> yes. And at the Metro Court pool. Don't yes. forget. All right. The extras are like, this is my shot. I, I'm not throwing away my shot. 
like every yeah, time. I, I, I think we should. I want to be a shady extra too, but the one that catches Dante's eye just That's for it. a hot minute, like he's waiting for Sam, and then he's like, Wow, who's that? He is Kelly Monaco. It was so good to see her on the red carpet. And she looked, she looked amazing. She looked amazing. Tanisha Harper. When does Tanisha not look amazing? I'm right. like, girl, could you please leave some fine for the rest of us? Some of us are normal, Tanisha. And I love the Bob. Amazing. Oh my God. Bob was amazing. Bob amazing. was so good. And then you have Brooke coming out there looking like a, like a goddess. I said, okay, G- okay, GH lady, y'all showing out. Right, maybe the actresses should, you know, dress themselves. <laughs> Woo! See, that's Frank. The Frank? Was that Frank? <laughs> As I'm like, let me turn on and not disturb. My <laughs> it's my East Coast family not knowing when to call. They always do the, the FaceTime, but not all the time. Amazing. But yeah, they looked just they and they also looked like they were having such a good time. Um, I was like looking at some of the actors like Instagram stories. Uh, they looked so happy. They like all seemed genuinely excited for each other. Um that's like the beauty of award shows and like celebrating each other i'm sure that they love that it was in person too they've missed that so i loved it i thought it was really great um i thought it was a very entertaining show the categories were like i think put in the right order to keep my attention and the show was short enough it wasn't like you know like some shows are like four hours like this is like the right amount of time for a show yes i appreciated the length and the, the, exactly what you said about the categories, because I'm really mostly just carried by the acting categories. Coming in hot. So do you have do we have anything else before we get into this short week? Um, looking forward to Nicholas Chavez's supporting actor win next year. Yes. Oh, and like a sweet baby angel, he like they asked him, um, you know, did he forget anybody in this speech? And he like thanked Sprina fans on the carpet, like after. I was like, he's a sweetie. He's very sweet. He is. It's like, I'm just like, we're on the bottom floor of his career. We're going to watch him go and like we can say, you know, we were there when. <laughs> Just like, seriously, my godson at a school play. I'm just like, <laughs> you got this, baby. <laughs> I know. I was like, give my child the the material he deserves. I can't wait for this Nicholas fallout. He did an interview where he was like talking about it. He was like, I don't really know how they come back from this. <laughs> I was like. This is going to be very good Emmy real material for you. And hopefully for Mora as well. Yes. Mm. Turn that shit down, Mora. I mean, Ava. (laughs) Yes, and. All right. Let's get into a short recap of a short week. So we had... Uh, we only had three days this week, one of them being the 15,000th episode due to preemption. So short um, recap. <clears throat> ready? Let me see if I'm ready. Okay, here we go. Um, Laura and Cyrus have drinks at the Outdoor Metro Court restaurant. They talk about the fact that Cyrus is not behind their attempts on their lives, and Laura believes that it has to be with Victor. She also tells Martin that she doesn't believe Jennifer Smith killed Luke, and she thinks Victor had a hand in that too. Across the way, Felicia wants to pop champagne because she confronted Ryan Chamberlain, much to Max's dismay. Um, Esme showed up to her uncle Kevin's office to ask him about Ryan and genetics. 
Um, and he warns her again to stay away from Ryan. Kevin joins Laura, Mac, and Felicia at the Metro Court and finds out that Esme is still in contact with Ryan. Ryan finds Esme at Kelly's and tells her that she is no longer employed at Spring Ridge because he pulled the plug on that. Spencer talks with his great uncle Victor and asks him to look into Esme, Esme's biological family. Victor warns Spencer against it, but eventually agrees to do it for him. <clears throat> Trina arrives home to Portia, Taggart, and Curtis. She reluctantly tells them what she and Joss found at a biker bar. Um, Taggart is upset. Portia is reluctant as well, but she is also proud. And Curtis said he will follow up on the lead, <laughs> finally. Um, the Vanna drive-in date continues as they watch Casablanca. Valentine goes to get Anna some popcorn with a lot of shade for popcorn, which I appreciate because I hate popcorn. Um, and when he returns, he tells, uh, she tells him that he received a text while he was gone. Nervously, he asked who it was from. And Anna told him she ain't looking at his text messages. Who do you think you are? Um, he tells her it's about ELQ and asks for a second date, which she agrees to. But we see that Anna Devane side eye because she wants us to know that she knows that Valentine's up to something. The standalone episode that we'll talk about later sees Laura being recalled. Uh, we find out that Cyrus is helping with friends of Fort Charles <laughs> and um, that he has been transferred to Pentonville. Um, I hope that him being close means we get a little bit more of him. Moving on to the last day of the week, Brad gives Brent a piece offering and shares that Selena Wu had text decks, aka Cody beat up. Dante tells Cody about Britt's past, all of its shady colors, um, and text decks reacts very interestingly when he finds out that Britt is Faison's daughter. Dante takes him back to the hospital because he's in pain and Britt tends to him again. Though we thought we were getting lucky, and Cody was going to hop on a bus to leave town. We see that he is hanging around. Shocking, I know. Carly excitedly and smugly tells Olivia about her investment in Aurora. We find out that she put up half the Metro Court to buy stock. At the ELQ vote, Valentine retains ELQ with Ned's vote and says absolutely the hell not to the ELQ Aurora merger. And the happiest news of my week, it seems that Chase may not be able to remain a cop because he cannot keep his hands to himself. But BLQ talks to Link and uh, agrees to continue working with him if he drops the charges on Chase. And that is our very short week, minus 15,000 15, episodes which we'll talk about um, on its own. How did you feel about those two days? They're all good. I mean, I thought here's overall, I thought the week was good. It helps that it it helped that it was short. Um I thought Monday's episode was one of the best episodes we've had in a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, I appreciated the mix of storylines, but yet they were all very connected. So it was like the kids, but also connecting back to the Cassidines and the vets and like Esme and Kevin and like all that stuff was so good. It was an excellent everyday, like non-sweeps episode. Um, and then I thought Friday was fine. Like it wasn't storylines that I particularly care about weren't really like the thing on Friday, but um, I liked the Chillin stuff overall over the week. Their storyline is the most engaging that I've found it in a while. And um, even though I don't really care about like the Cody, Cody text decks, Brit stuff, I thought it was well done, relatively speaking. And just like, this is the most I cared about ELQ um, because finally like there are some stakes. So I liked, I liked the week. I thought it was fine. It was good to find.
I really enjoyed um, the scenes with uh, Trina and her family. Obviously, always love those scenes. Um, and you know, as a Carly fan, the only way I can like Carly is when she gets a little comeuppance. You know what I'm saying? Like, if she always won, she would be inseparable. But I like her having to like lose and then like claw her way back up to win. Um, so I'm really the most I've ever cared about ELQ was to know that she like made this dumbass investment and like has 30 days to try to keep the Metro Court. Ooh, that's gonna be very interesting. Um, and like, you know, just like wipe some of that smugness off her face for for a minute. Um, it'll be back, I'm sure. But that's like that's like the Carly stories that I really enjoy, where like you're watching her like kind of fight against adversity and not just win all the time. Um, so I really enjoyed, and I enjoyed seeing that. And I mean, I think I'm gonna enjoy like the story that comes after. It's like kind of similar to like as a Spencer fan, like I loved him having to beg um, Cam for a job. It's still like one of my favorite moments for them. And I love him being so torn up about Rorina, like, because you need that balance. You need like also the, the joy that comes with seeing your character, like get a little too, um, overly confident and smug and seeing them, you know, you gotta, if you're really invested in a character, you want to see them be well-rounded. And sometimes that means, you know, being publicly humiliated and losing everything. But I think in terms of favorite moments, well, obviously like top, top was Laura and Cyrus. Um, but I know Tanya has more to say about that. I would, of course, the Vanna part two, for all the reasons um, that we talked about last week, honestly, it was just like more of everything that was like wonderful about those scenes. And like, you thought notorious parallels. Oh, we're gonna close with Casablanca? Say less. Perfect. What else is there to say? Um, and then the other favorite scenes I had were Esme and Kevin. Those were oh, so good. good, especially Kevin finally gave us the like what we we as viewers have really needed, which was for Esme to take an L. And it was uh, John Lindstrom and Avery Pohl as scene partners. Delightful. Love watching yeah. them together. He has, he has very sweet things to say about her. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy like him talking about working with her. Tanya, what did you, what were your favorite moments and who was your performer of the week? Even though I think you kind of know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'd have, I mean, my favorite moments, I think we're all in simpatico about the favorite moments. I mean, I would say um, first the Kevin and Esme scenes. What really I loved about them was, well, when I always love Kevin and Esme together because it's like, I think even though she's, you know, super somewhat loyal to Ryan and she's doing Ryan's bidding, I think she also tries to seek in a weird way, I think she's seeking some kind of approval or acknowledgement from Kevin. Yeah. And so she really kind of went to him and was like, you know, this unattachment thing, is that hereditary? Like she's super concerned about that. And it shows some real vulnerability. And I loved that scene. I also agree. I loved when Kevin was like, no, you're not seeing Ryan anymore. <laughs> and he was like on it just like that. It was like, ooh, well, that's what you get, lady. So, I mean, that, those were great, awesome scenes. Um, yes, Vanna, super romantic. That's all I had. Those were no notes. So romantic, perfect date. I want to date him. I want to date Valentine. <laughs> if it wasn't Dante out there, man, Valentine. <laughs> um, so there's that. Um, 
but yeah, my I think one one outside of the performances, my favorite, really great favorite scene was that that montage of Laura. I mean, of Carly was like, yeah, we're gonna make a lot of money. I'm gonna make a lot of money because I did this and I invested half of Metro Court <laughs> to this. I was like, half. You didn't even like you took all of your stake of Metro Court to invest in Aurora. Like, ma'am, you could have taken like maybe a third, maybe just like a, a quarter. Why are you gonna take all of it? That was just the stupidest decision. Like, she got no attorney, like no accountant advising her or anything. Um, well, I think her financial advisor actually said, don't do it. And she was oh. like, good. Yeah. Like there was a scene where, where she just, well, yeah, but I wasn't expecting her to say like, I'm taking my whole ownership of Metro quote and investing. Like maybe she's taking, I thought she had liquid funds and he was saying, no, don't do it. She took, she took Metro quote. That was stupid. But then to juxtapose it also with the quarter mains, with Drew and with Michael, just so confident. Like this is gonna uh, happen. And this is, we're gonna get out Valentine and just being all smug about it. And assuming they had Ned. Ned never once gave him an indication that he was in support of what they were doing. But they still assumed because of family that he was gonna go along with it. And so when well, they, the way they tried to backtrack on that is to say that it was Ned's idea to give Valentine out. That's like the way they tried to backtrack on that. Yeah, but still, it was no, they were stupid. Yeah, they were very stupid. And to juxta, and, and I think like this was actually fabulous directing. And this is, I guess, the directors really did a great job because it was like they juxtaposed the celebrate celebratory toast that you know Carly had with Olivia. And then they also showed how Valentine was chilling for a minute. <laughs> and then he was like, okay, I gotta go. And then, and then they were like watching him and they're like, what's he got up his sleeve? I don't know, but he's gonna lose. You know, they were like thinking and they were strategizing about him. And he walks in all cool as a cucumber, like, okay, we're gonna conduct this meeting. Oh, you wanna, you know, I disagree with you making me wanna leave, but here's my argument. And he was just like, cool as a cucumber and then when ned was just like i vote no that was beautiful i had recorded that scene and i tweeted it because it was just amazing <laughs> so yes that was like one of my favorite scenes um okay so you know but get to the meaty greedy best um performance I didn't even have, like, usually I have a first, third, fourth choice. I didn't. It was Jeff Cobra all the way because it was beautiful because he, like, in the, I don't even know how many minutes. We always talk about how short the scenes are. It was maybe, what, three minutes, four minutes? Oops. In that whole scene, he displays so much range. You know, the righteous, you know, indignation of, um, you know, being wronged by Laura and just wanting her to see that he's changed because he's a better man than her now because he has religion. And, you know, feeling, you know, like he was totally right in making sure that she loses her job, but then needing and wanting her approval and her acceptance and then being so hurt by the, and shocked and surprised by the idea that she would forgive him. Like he was like speechless. And it was, it was amazing. Like that scene alone, I was like, oh my God, please give him some kind of award. And he got an award. So it was like, awesome. But yes, Jeff, that, you know, three or four minutes back. Yeah. yeah. Text Sandra. <laughs> I have some ideas, Frank, about storylines for Jeff Cober. <laughs> yeah. He's so great. I love, I love that moment when he dropped the phone. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm, that was such a, that was such an amazing choice. Um, and just the, the whole journey that his face took. Yeah. Was so good. And like, just also like what he offered Jeannie to as such a generous scene partner, that mm -hmm. moment when he hit the glass, 
Oh my gosh. She was like, you're like, you could tell that that was in the moment and right. she reacted in the moment. And it was just, it, I, I mean, I imagine that they really do just like kind of go in and play and see what happens. Um, cause they're both such pros and they also do oh. have this like Mm-hmm. working relationship from working together um when he was a regular and I uh, it was masterful mm-hmm. both of them um but it, you know it was really an opportunity for Jeff to be like don't forget about me don't sleep on me I'm Jeff Cober I'm t- coming for that guest to me next year thank you right? <laughs> Yeah, I thought he was, I mean, it's just like another testament to like the phenomenal actors that we have on GH. And I think that that's like the thing that ends up, fr- because our actors are so good, that's the thing that sometimes frustrates the storyline because we should be blowing it out of the water. Mm-hmm. We have Jeannie Francis and Jeff Cobra in the scene. There's no way there should be a boring week. We have Fanola Hughes. Period. Like, like you can just leave it there. We have Fanola Hughes. The end. What else is there to say? It, it there nothing should be Fanola Hughes deserves to be where nothing is bad. <laughs> yes. You know what I'm saying? She deserves no boring weeks, even if she's not in them. She should not be associated with boring weeks. Because also like the vets especially are so good at even like at making exposition exciting. Mm-hmm. I mean, and this is what starting to go into like talking about the 15th thousandth episode. Just take it there. So I, um, I really loved... Um, actually, this was actually right before, but like leading in, they had to do uh, a little bit of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Damn, my brain. Um, exposition to set up for the 15,000th episode on Monday. And so it was like a lot of like, I, in particular, like Martin and Laura kind of recapping Cyrus, recapping Luke's storyline like they were really just having a recap conversation and and it was really compelling and interesting mm-hmm. and that's because Jeannie and Michael E. Knight are legends um and so even they can even take a boring a boring scene and make it alive but you have to put the focus on the right characters too. Right. There are some characters that are actually feel very easy to write for. And then there were other characters like Sunny, for example, that they don't know how to write for anymore. So, right. but yes, let's talk about the 15,000th episode. 15,000. That's a huge scope. That's a lot of also it's it's very um momentous and uh I think there was a lot of kind of like mixed opinions about whether or not the episode meant met that moment Uh um so what do you all think about whether or not did it meet the moment did you enjoy it um how, you know, how about how they use the cast, right? We've been talking about this very talented group of vets that we have and beyond. Um, What did you all think? Mm. Yeah, you know, I liked, um, I liked it. I, I, there are definitely like improvements that could have been made, I'm sure, but it wasn't by any means bad. and one of the things I did like was that you don't actually have, this is, it's a double-edged sword because there's like, you didn't have to watch the show prior to like get here. Like you could watch, you could be like, oh, I haven't watched GH in years. Let me watch this episode and you can get something out of it. 
And you can either say, I actually want to see what continues to happen or I'm actually good. But that also meant that there were things that kind of didn't make sense or like things that frustrated me as an everyday viewer. One of those things, and I will continue to harp on it always, is that we were able to solve for Laura what happened with a recall in one episode from Curtis, but you haven't done anything for Trina. And so like, as a everyday viewer, like I understand why it needed to be that way in a contained episode, but as an everyday viewer, I was like, part of series, this is what we doing. Okay. Can I can I comment on that point? Always. I was <laughs> I was frustrated by, you know, I've been frustrated by this this whole time, right? But for me, that that moment really hit home again more on the Mondays episode when Trina comes home, right? Again, they're all, you know, upset that she had went to the bar. Why did she have to go to a bar? You know, you're a cop, you're a, a, a private investigator, you're doing everything but help Trina. And you're mad at her for trying to help herself. They even talked about it. They're like, I, I guess um, Portia was like, well, we haven't been able to help her so far. So I'm not surprised that she's been able to do it. Yes, note that you haven't helped her except for Portia being a supportive mom. Yes, that's what she's going to do. And she's a doctor. So she doesn't have any investigative skills or whatever. But, and this is the fault of the writers. I'm sure Tagger wants to be all up in the mix you know wants to wants to be investigating and all this other stuff but the writers aren't having him do that all right aren't having us see us show him I mean show him doing that kind of work so I was just yelling at you know Taggart it will mainly Curtis the whole time on Monday the whole time it was like this is what you should have done as the adult in her life she shouldn't have had to put herself in that kind of danger but you know you're off doing everything else but but yeah <laughs> <laughs> you're very upset about this i definitely understand <laughs> um the other thing i thought um in this answer i want to hear from what you think too i didn't think they did a good job of using the young adults. Like I love that Spencer was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Laura hugs. Yeah. And like his, you know, a great grandmother and even better like uh, role model. Like very sweet. You can like see the relationship just continue to grow between them um, as actors, as people, as characters. But yeah, like with something like that, like I would have loved to see more kids. Yeah. Um, I I would have loved to see Liz's kids. Like, what the hell was Maxie doing going to visit Liz? That was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Like and, Maxie, and, and all she brought was makeup, which was nice. But did I was Elizabeth like, pick up the na- Did Elizabeth pick up the makeup and be like, "Oh yes, this is what I've been looking for"? <laughs> There's too much history between those characters for me to care about y'all giving makeup. I mean, Maxie should have been at the. Baseball. Maxie should have been at the getting her nails done, with oh, yeah. with, with the vet, yeah. Yeah. and like been looking like what's going on. You know what I mean? Like that's right. the kind of stuff that's fun when you have like legacy characters find out what their parents and grandparents and aunties and uncles been up to. Yes, like Maxie reacting to all of them talking about Scott would have been like would have been me honestly because like Maxie and I are the same age being like (laughs) hi um I I thought that I thought that Liz's reaction to Maxie being there was on point like she was like the fuck you doing here (laughs) and honestly it kind of seemed like Christmas Storms was a little like I don't know I guess I don't know my job to act this scene it don't make any sense but who am I I'm just an actor given a weird scene here I'm here um what I will say I love the flashbacks I loved Bobby's flashback most of all yes 
I loved it. I thought the Bobby and Laura scenes didn't make any sense. Like Bobby <laughs> as the red herring to use a softball metaphor. They love softball so much on GH. It was out of left field. It was very strange. Like why of all times now would be Bobby going after Laura. Um, but I loved her. I loved her flashback. I love Ho Bobby. Um, and I loved like the little like they, the election fraud shit of like, I thought I was saving the whales. I just thought it was like a funny little bit. And I do think it's nice when GH can like lean into the humor because they actually do that really well. Um, what I didn't love was Scott. There was so much Scott. It was too much. Weasel. And that was part of it. Like, like, I get why they were leaning on Scott because it's like, we needed, like, who else are they going to pull out from like way, way back in Laura's history that's still on the show? Um, but it didn't need to be this much. I would have liked some like more Kevin always. It just felt like more appropriate and like why Scott's kind of useless and he didn't really do anything so like why is he being featured he was just like talking a lot that's it I mean it was very realistic it was very much like if your ex-husband who is ridiculous like jumped in and was like let me help you I'm sure um I liked the Lucy and Bobby rivalry moment like I always love those throwbacks where like listen this isn't like some fucking maxi showing up to bring makeup to Liz and we're gonna pretend like everything's okay like to the death it's on site <laughs> but like over Scott you know and then throwing in like we don't need the Scott and Liesl moment in this episode I'm not anti Scott and Liesl it's like the most entertained I've ever been by honestly any of Scott's relationships because I'm like such a hater um but it's it wasn't needed in this episode I mm, no too much Scott I don't know what what they were doing with Sunny. I they, I think they were just like we need Sunny in this episode because reasons because GH um which I get like sure but uh, why was he fake hurt? He was Sunny, yeah, he's in the Oh ER. yeah, and he got like punched by Chase or something. I mean something just so he can have a scene with Jophiel <laughs> yeah because they were like well we can't we don't have enough COVID tests for um his actual child so let's have Jophiel carry her carry him on her back as well again <laughs> um I loved how disgusted Sam was with Scott and like honestly with everyone she just like had this disgusted vibe every time Scott talked like she was like she Sam was me I felt like if there was anyone in that episode who was truly like the stand-in for the audience from my perspective it was Sam being like what and also yeah. like her being at the cues being like mm -hmm. uh, the cue scenes were very weird. Like the quarter main scenes. It just, it felt empty. And not just like content wise, which yes. Um, but it's, you know, it's fine. It's like, it's a standalone episode, but like it literally felt empty because like the quarter mains, and we've talked about this before, like they're like, loud talking over each other there's a bunch of them anything can happen at any moment like it's a really frenetic energy and so for their scene to be like of all people olivia monologuing uninterrupted felt very unquarter main and like there's so few quarter mains on the canvas at this point they had to have carly and sam there and even with the addition of carly and sam it just felt like an empty room. And Drew wasn't there. But I mean, you have so few quarter maids, like why aren't all of them there? I thought, was Drew not there? 
No. I thought he was there, but then I thought he was there. I don't know that whole scene. But he didn't do anything. Yeah. Damn, if he was there, I mean, I'm gonna go look, but if he was there, I definitely didn't remember him. He didn't say anything. Mm, I don't think he said anything. They didn't even have white. He's, he's probably still mad at Ned. <laughs> this was before. This was before, yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay. Um I loved the Cassidines huddling together at the Metro Court pool. Yeah. Um, and Alexis actually like associating with them. Okay. And I liked the Alexis, Ava, Laura dynamic. That was fun. That's like, those are like three people you don't get to see interacting with each other that much, like in this way, mm-hmm. um, as like connected to the Cassidines. Um, and that, even though like they have about the same amount of active characters on the canvas as the cues, it just like the Cassidines have like, it's been a long time since they felt like this alive as a family. And so I just continue to hearts for my favorite family. Um, even though Nicholas Chavez is like barely talked, but you know what? You know what my child's gonna do? Do great background acting. <laughs> yeah, I think that it, it is, the Cassidy has always felt small but mighty. And the Q's strength has always been in how many of them it was. Yeah. That we are like this big major family. We have this big ass house. We all live here. You know, it's bustling. It's busy. You know, it's busy. Um, and to not have that like felt really weird. I mean, I know Monica, um, or Leslie Charles uh, had hurt herself, and but like her presence was so missed. So, so. Um, I honestly, I mean, I the only quarter main. I think that people probably would have recognized was Ned. Like if you were like an old, like an old time viewer, you know. Um, I we could have had Ned somewhere else. I mean, I just didn't. It yeah, the quarter maze. It wasn't giving. It just was not giving. And like Ned is recognizable, but he's also not recognizable. Right. Like he's not anything like the character that he used to be. So mm-hmm. that's also just like I if I was a new, like an old viewer tuning back in, I'd be like, damn, what happened to Ned? He looks boring. <laughs> I know you got it in you, Ned. He didn't even have his guitar out. Not even they didn't even let him have his guitar this time. Um, yeah. So for me. To answer the question whether or not it rose to 15,000, I kind of feel like the import of 15,000 probably couldn't have been done in one episode. I almost feel like it should have had more of a buildup all week and then culminated into the 15,000. But because I'm someone that works in local government, (laughs) I enjoyed this a lot because a lot of what happens in real life, local government politics was reflected in the show. The idea of a friends for Port Charles, oh my God. You know, Oakland has that same kind of organization. They're not called Friends of Oakland, but same type of organization, same type of people, not led by someone in jail, but basically the same <laughs> type of people, the same type of arguments not against the mayor, unfortunately, but against the progressive right. people, council members. They're doing the exact same stuff. And they're not necessarily doing a recall because it's election time. And so what they're doing is they're putting other candidates up and making these same kind of arguments. Lackluster police department, yes, but they're blaming the council for it because of defunding. Um, they're doing like making all these shady comments, the type of people that are grouping together to kind of combat and protect um, the council members are the same type of people you have union leaders, you have businesses, you have, you know, just all the dynamics. I loved it. <laughs> I was just like, yes, it was hilarious to me. Boo to the police propaganda, though. Amen. <laughs> 
Lauren didn't have to be like, oh yes, we owe everything to police. That was like one of my notes too. It was like, it literally my note was, fuck the PCD, PD, but otherwise it was, it was a nice speech. Yeah. So I love that, you know, propaganda. Right. But I appreciated, you know, seeing the work that I do kind of reflected on the television show. I enjoyed it a lot. So thank you, GH, for shout out to people that work in city government. (laughs) You know, that's so funny because as somebody who's lived through multiple recalls, I am from Wisconsin, like I've lived through so many recalls, I was like, this wouldn't have happened. Like I it was so (laughs) hard for me not to be like a purist, like this signature collection wouldn't have ever gone through this wouldn't have happened Wait, and the, like, yeah so- i mean like the da ne- would not necessarily be in a group to help say it's How you the city attorney and the clerk that would make sure that the signatures were valid but <laughs> i appreciate the attempt i was like why did you kick how did you kick mac out but not yeah Robert? yeah the da that was <laughs> that didn't make any kind of sense but i appreciate because they don't have city clerk and da characters on the show <laughs> yeah so i'm interested to see um what's the carryover like are we gonna go through a recall storyline like right, right. what's about to yeah. happen because it definitely it wasn't resolved right like it made it that lawyer's speech at the end definitely made it seem like oh the recall is to come Mm -hmm. i mean it could happen for november that's probably what they're gonna do they're gonna make it a storyline maybe around the election um and like victor had (laughs) been about like oh the cassadines finally united in service of you so it would be interesting if they actually carried through with that and like Mm -hmm had Victor try to ingratiate himself to Laura. Meanwhile, she's also trying to get him deported. And we still don't know about what his plan is and what Valentine's involvement is. So I do hope that there is carryover. Um, And also just because like, I want more Laura-centric story. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And I want to see, and obviously I want to see Cyrus again and I would love it felt like they were setting the Laura and story Laura and Cyrus story up for another chapter whether that's going to be happening anytime soon but like for whatever they do decide to pick that back up it's there's something brewing there I also had a couple notes. I laughed out loud at Selena Wu. She ain't got no, she ain't giving no dance. Yes, I contribute to this. <laughs> Why wouldn't I? Of course. Like that, like, yes. Oh, like, go girl. Um, the sentence from Laura to Liz, you are so loved. I was just like, that was so ironic, given the controversy of not seeing Liz on the show. And then Laura saying, You're so loved. I was like, I don't know. The directors don't seem to love her. <laughs> She's hardly ever on the show. It just seemed like really ironic to me to have that being said. And then I also did notice that Nicholas didn't hug his mama like everybody else did. <laughs> Can we talk about what Nicholas, <laughs> the real Nicholas Cassidy would be doing? Oh my God. He would probably run the whole show. Right? He would have been doing what Scotty was exactly doing, right? Like, he would have been convening the meeting. He would have been like, oh, I already found out. You know, like, he would have been throwing his money around. He would have been you know, at no goddamn softball game. <laughs> that is oh. not where Nicholas Cassidine would be, like, goofing around at some softball game. Please. Yeah, I mean, I think that they just know that Marcus can't handle it, so they just fuck it. Yeah, they were like, well, let's just have him be a background actor with Nicholas Chavez. Let's still give Nicholas Chavez more. You know what? Let me not. Let's not make this about Marcus. Um, (laughs) We'll just, uh, of note, 
who are Laura's family members that we care about? We would have liked to have seen them featured more. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Anyway. Would have loved to have seen Liz's, like I think you already named. William, yeah. See Liz's kids, to see William. And I agree about the young adults piece. Like, especially like, I understand not having Joss and Trina there, um, but William was certainly missed. Yeah. Um, he definitely would have been at the softball game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, working at the Metro Court, he would have been there. Oh, yeah. BLQ and Chase were cute. They were. I liked that moment. Yeah. It was like nice. I was like, oh, romance. Well, well this is random, but I'll, you remember that this is a soap opera and they're supposed to be romance with like relatively young people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They definitely look like a couple. Like they were just like very comfortable with each other, very flirty, very cute. Mm-hmm. Um, they should have left um, Charlie's to go bang, but we know that that didn't happen. Well, this is this is General Hospital in 2022. So what can you do? I did appreciate like seeing. I feel like this is the biggest cast gathering, right? Like cast of actors gathering on GH in a long time. So I I did actually uh, minus the propaganda, loved the voiceover, and then kind of zooming in on the different characters. I thought that was very. It was a nice touch. It was a nice way to end. And similar to what y'all have said, like 15,000 is a lot to live up to. (laughs) Like that's a lot. And I mean, in my ideal scenario, it would have been like some climax related to the, you know, the ice princess. And it would have been tied up in a much larger story. Uh, But that is all really an issue with the show overall is like so I will say for the show as it is right now and the constraints that they're working with and that like what you said Tanya like one episode can never live up to 15,000 um I thought it was like funny and sentimental in like good ways and um had a few like really really powerful moments and then just that amazing performance between Jeannie and Jeff really like sold it to me yeah I really like during the background like during the voiceover like seeing folks just like interact in the background I think that um Alexis and Sunny had like some cute moments and that like kind of that were like blink if you miss them um and it just like shows that if you just like let these people go they know their character you know the character relationships um and they could and, and it all, almost was like, I, I almost am like, writers, let's play a game. Look at all these people in the room. Why don't you think about all the ways that they're related to each other and like the relationships that they hold and like how they hold them and then write for that. Like everything doesn't have to be a one-off or everything doesn't have to just be so plot driven. What would it look like if we had more Sunny and Alexis because of their friendship? What would it look like if we had whatever it was? Um, because that you know that's the part I think that that's that's missing is that we don't have a lot of great like relationship driven drama. Yeah. Yep. Well, what about the rest of the week? Yeah, let's just hot take it. Uh, what are your hot takes for the week? Oh. We can just go round robin. So one. <laughs> go ahead, Sandra. You can start. Oh, well, um, I there. I will say the dialogue on Monday and the fifteen thousandth episode in particular. I thought there were so many great dialogue moments. Um, and I really loved in the vanity. There were, I mean, there were so many zingers. Um, toxic gas is one thing. Disappointing you is a whole different ball game. Loved that. I haven't disappointed you tonight, have I, darling? No, despite your best efforts. Like just that <laughs> pop in dialogue. Of course, I'm keeping secrets from you, darling. <laughs> ah, Vanna. And then um, you know what this popcorn and the next feature have in common? 
they were both made in 1942. I loved it. It was cheesy. It was corny. It was appropriate for a first date in a drive-in watching Casablanca with Vanna. Just again, no notes. Loved it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do I have anything? Go ahead, Tanya. Um, I have my what didn't work, which is a hot take, I guess. Um, Cody, still. I mean, even you know the shirt, the shirtless scene is supposed to elicit a kind of response of "Ooh, he's hot," and "Ooh, we need to see more shirtless Cody." No, not only was he shirtless, he was pantless. And it still was like, what the fuck? Why? And Brooke and Brent walked in the door and was like, why? <laughs> and she was just like, <laughs> I was like, I didn't understand. Why did he not, why did he not have any pants on? And it was just like pointless. I was not like, oh my God, Cody's amazing. I want him more of the show because he's so hot. He is the best. Of- no, he doesn't. And it was just like pointless. So I was like, why is he still here? And it gave him another reason to be here. I'm a little curious as to why he cares that Brit is Faison's daughter, but they could, you know, write a note and tell us. <laughs> No, <laughs> no. They get at the end be like, Cody cares about Brit being Faison's daughter because so and so, and I'll be like, oh, okay. <laughs> they don't. I don't need to see him on the show anymore. Tanya just wants a post-it note. She does not <laughs> want the storyline. No, I do not. This is like, is this a storyline or is this an email? Right. No. Definitely could have been, been a, it could have been an email that's it um, and again it just highlights why are they throwing this man in my face and roger howarth is out there why okay i'm done yeah yeah my my overall was just like i think that if we are going to have new characters they should have a point and they should like be tied to families that we care about um, and so I think about like a Roger Howard, like so they bought him in as a quarter main who like immediately threw that shit away. So what was the point? Like, why would you have Austin become a quarter main if like, come in as a quarter main and like he doesn't do any, like he's not even part of the ELQ vote because he gave it up. You know, like I just, I don't want to see any new people who are not building on and like actually added him to the story as opposed to people that you have to write new story for um and that becomes really frustrating to me like i don't need a deck like bring back dylan like if you want if you want quarter remains like i don't need whatever like add a cast nine um and that's just like really i think something that's been frustrating to me as we find out that people are, get, are getting like cast over text message i'm like okay well cast him to like something that makes legacy families stronger and not that you know I yeah yeah because I think it's like one thing when we bring on non-related characters because everyone's related like we do have to add new characters that aren't immediately related to someone on the show but he was brought on to be with Brit who is not a legacy character so he could have been anyway, whatever. <laughs> not, no, me, that's not, not me cutting me off from my own point. I'm like, I don't even care about my point. That's how little I care about this story. That's exactly how I did. I cut myself. I was like, well, it's stupid. Just no, no more. Just I, I don't. I do. I, I think the one thing I did, and this is like, this is, I should. This is not even props. This is just you did what you're supposed to do they actually acknowledged Dante and Britt's relationship with exposition so this was one of the exposition scenes that I thought was of note this week that was actually done well like the way that you're supposed to do exposition on soap like it was like Dante dispassionately listing Britt's exploits 
and then text decks being like the fuck that's right. like how you do exposition on a soap so congratulations people did their jobs i i would I, okay i'll give them one thing we see a lot more of dante on the show with cody there but we can see a lot more of dante with sam we can see a lot more of dante investigating trina's <laughs> you know thing we can see a lot more dante trying to rein in michael we can see a lot more of dante all the time he can insert himself in every single storyline basically we do not need cody there I will say I prefer actually Dante and Textex to Dante and his uh, Corintho side of the family. That's how much I hate like the Dante Sonny Michael dynamic. <laughs> you know? It's not it's it's not meant to be any sort of compliment about Textex slash Cody or the writing around it. It's just how bad the sunny storyline is yeah i don't know <laughs> yeah that's all I'm like i'm mixed i'm like i really just don't want cody there at all <laughs> i just i don't i i continue to be frustrated that we don't have like sante story um and i was one of the people the whole house was like okay y'all it'll be okay because then we'll get it and it'll be good and now we don't have I mean again look at me just being like cutting myself off I think that Sante has like very natural chemistry and like organic story story to be told and they did not need Cody or any of these other people to tell it um and it is frustrating to me that we don't get it um Yes, Dante, what's going on with you and this story? Just go home and make sweet, sweet love to Sam. We know that we know that Dom knows. Dom knows. Um, I really loved the Victor and Spencer scenes on Monday. They were so good. Excellent scene for uh, Nicholas Chavez leading into his first of many Emmy wins. Daytime and prime time, manifest it. Um, I loved, um, I love it when they do this with Spencer uh, where he's like telling the truth, but he's not being totally honest. Like he's yeah. saying honest things, but he's not being transparent. He's being very opaque. And I loved that. I loved that with him and Victor. Uh, I loved like the, uh, I know you have very strong feelings for Esme. <laughs> you have no idea. That was my favorite. There were so many of those great moments, but that one was so good. Um, I like that Victor is on to Esme. Like he names, you know that she made up that pregnancy scare, right? Like he's really been the first person to like really name that. And so I appreciated that. And he was like, you better make sure before you sleep with crazy again. Like this is the speech that actually Spencer needed from the beginning. He needed someone to give him this speech much earlier um, so that they don't end up with a Cassidine baby, which uh, it's too bad he's actually talking the wrong Cassidine. So I don't love that this is obviously foreshadowing an ick pregnancy, but I loved that uh, exchange. And I just also wanted to know that Spencer chooses to like work Victor, but he chose to be honest with Sam, with the mm -hmm. good Catherine. And I, I like that contrast of like, how he is with Laura, even though he wasn't being totally honest with her, like Laura, how he is with Sam and like those family members versus how he is with the Cassidines. And it's not that there's not love there or even like real care, but he's like, he knows his Cassidine family 
like he knows who he can trust with what and when and so I just loved seeing him like seeing um Spencer in his like full Cassidyness, but like very much like in his power and like actually moving along a plan so I also love that there was like finally we're starting to see some more movement in this sex tape storyline because it's been excruciating otherwise I think um Valentin is very similar in that way he doesn't necessarily interact with Laura that much or Sam but he treats Alexis right. in that same kind of way where like they both Valentin and Nicholas kind of play their other Cassadine family in a different manner than the people that they have other relationships with so and I've seen that meme around where Victor and Spencer are very similar that people think that they're all they're the same but they hate each other <laughs> a lot so it's pretty interesting yeah um I was really excited about the prospect of a Frida Warina love triangle and what that would mean for uh, like all of the characters involved but the pacing of it has made it really difficult for me to be invested. Um, and part of it is that we actually just have not had any Sabrina scenes when it's just like such a natural set of scenes to have. They work together as a gallery, like that should be constant. Um, I do love how Trin is used. I love that she is like with family, she's with friends. Um, but I, I just think that the Sabrina fandom has been um like a strong base for a while and to not I mean like people were like you know fan service yeah you should do fan service you should um and so it just like there's no build for who Rory is there's not scenes with Spencer and, and Trina like showing the like attraction that's like still hard to fight like I would love for them to be in scenes where where Trina is like something doesn't feel right about what he's saying and what he's doing, and starting to have those doubts while she's also still like starting to like Rory. Like the the good parts of the love triangle are not present enough for me to like be invested, um, and that's really unfortunate because Trina deserves that. Yeah. Um, and I think Sprina fans, I am Sprina fan, deserve like Sprina scenes um, to like carry us and to like allow us to stay, remain invested in the invested in the couple. And so like it's one thing to be frustrated about like the pace; it's another thing to be frustrated about the lack of scenes that they share. And it's very frustrating to have them like not share many scenes at all. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> It seems like they really just like paused this storyline almost entirely for May and June. Like no, nothing advanced really uh, up until like the past week. There has been like no storyline advancement and there's been like little scenes here or there obviously to like, but the focus of their being investment in the storyline versus in April when it was like when Tabiana was first really featured as Trina we saw so much and so this kind of like start and stop hasn't been great and I agree like uh I understand why it can't be Sprina all the time right now um and you gotta give us something to work with there's so much natural tension there that um, you don't even necessarily need to advance the storyline. Like you were saying, Tracy, like it can be about just showing the tension between them and showing the conflict and showing the doubts and the confusion. Um, even if at the end of the scene, she's like, well, fuck him anyway, right? Like that's part of also, like that is part of soap storytelling too, is having those back and forth moments even when the yeah. story can't move forward for whatever reason. Yeah, I just, I think Trina's so smart, um, but she also has always questioned herself when it comes to Spencer. 
um, and questioned her feelings and questioned all of that. And so I would love to see her struggling with listening to what he says and seeing how he is with her and like talking about that with somebody. You know what I'm saying? Like figuring out or, or and then like maybe even coming to the, the conclusion that it doesn't matter, but like we do need to still see that tension. We do need to still see um, that care. We need to see some, like those moments of tenderness, um, which is like the spring of sweet spot. Um, which is like, you know, conflict, tenderness, conflict, tenderness. And we're not getting that. And um, it's not serving the pairing that they've built. Yeah, I agree. It's also just like hard with these. um, Every time the show gets preempted, I'm like, it's not much longer before we get Sprina. just another day between me and Sprina. How can we go on? Because I look look at the spoilers and I'm like, you're that much further away. You're that much further away. Um, With the Esme and Kevin story or like those arcs, I know we talked about it a little bit, but I um. I was like, this is not like any undergrad psych program I've ever heard of. You got to apply to get into an undergrad psych program? Damn, maybe college is just different now that I'm old, but that's a lot. But like, I really liked your insight, Tanya, about how Esme, like, is devoted to Ryan but there is something about Kevin where she's trying to prove herself to him and sometimes that looks like trying to undermine him or question him but there is like a way she's trying to connect with him and like kind of I think almost kind of like gets a little bit of glee out of like tricking him like being like right under his nose this whole time um I did think that was really interesting when she was like, is, do you think it's genetic? And it had me wondering, I was like, does she, is she actually concerned that she's a psychopath? And that's, was just interesting to me. It was interesting the way that Avery played it. I liked the scene, even though like, I don't want Esme to be redeemed and it's still like, fuck Esme forever. And wow, this was an interesting performance. And an interesting turn for the character but I really loved where Kevin was like no no no, you're not a sociopath and then described Esme as she actually is which is like a psychopathic socio you know what I like it was like I I love that moment where she he was like oh you're not any of these things that you are um so I thought that was such a, ah, I just love John Lindstrom and Avery Pohl scenes. They're so good. And um, so refreshing to see oh, her with him. I'll say that. I'll say that, yeah. Um, I don't have any more hot takes, but I need some stop letting Marcus talk about it publicly. Right. That That's was what I was topic. like. I was like, oh, am I going to talk about Marcus here? I'm so tired, quite honestly, of talking about him because it's always the same, a, like desperate cries for attention and like pathetic, creepy shit that he says um, when he's being interviewed. But he was interviewed for Soap Opera Digest talking about, and we'll talk about the the previews that he was he was talking about he was just like talking about the ick relationship and making it into a love story and just trying to give deep insight into his character and it was not deep it was he was not talking about his own character as a beautiful you talking about this is not not, this is about he was talking about himself oh i have one more shady thing to say back to the show before the timeline I see y'all because <laughs> and it made me laugh because everybody I'm you know I'm the only cruise shipper I know was like 
you know, people be like going at Cameron Mathis and I'm like, yeah, all this is correct. <laughs> like y'all are not wrong about him being himself and not him not being Drew. I feel like it, it's okay. I'm not going to defend this shit because it's indefend- indefensible. But then he presented with Tanisha. People were like, we should have Jordan and, Jordan and Drew. Why are you trying to put Tanisha with a bed? Don't do my girl this way. Don't do her this way. And if you don't want him to be with Carly, say that. I loved it. And this is not for like the people I interact with. Cause like they're like very transparent, like, oh no, I don't fuck with Hartley. And like that's not for them. This that's perfectly fine. I love that, you know, the shadiness of like the people that we like, the versus we don't like. Talk about people who I don't interact with. I be seeing it. Well. I see it. But anyway, don't be, don't be trying to put Tanisha with somebody who we're saying is a dead. Jordan needs to have like a fine ass man. See if we can get Sean back. And then give them a front burner storyline. Thank you. Like they had back in the day. Like they had back in the day. Mm, that was a great storyline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have. Oh, I loved that Lucy was actually the person who like drove home getting Ned to Valentine's side. I loved that she, um, I just loved her energy that whole episode of just like a, huh, I'm here. Huh, I used to live here. Hmm, things are really different now. And (laughs) I'm gonna do what I want. And and that includes bringing Ned over to Valentine and Bay's side and my side because Valentine's making me money all around. Quite honestly, like Lucy's like I'm looking out for Lucy, and I loved it. Like I think, and this is you know this has been something that. Lucy fans have talked about a lot over the years, which is like the way in which kind of people treat Lucy or like see Lucy as like not being a serious character or like, you know, and she is, she's a comic relief character because you know why? Lynn Herring is a comedic genius. Um, But also like Lucy's a badass. Like Lucy is making money moves. And so I loved this little moment of like, oh, you thought that I was still just this little, you know, character lacking substance. Oh no, I am substantial. Thank you. And my substance is ruining your merger. Good day. One of the things that I was so tickled about like weeks and weeks ago maybe months ago when her and martin took up for the first time or like she had showed up with like that jacket on um z who is like who i follow on twitter was like i love lucy being a big old freak and laying it out for her man and all i heard was like the male megan the stallion song in the background <laughs> like, lucy playing, playing big old freak on the way to see martin i just really enjoy Lucy I think like you said she's so, like the actress is so funny she has this like neurotic energy that's like so consistent which is like really hard to play consistently through the years you know what I mean but she also to your point is like great businesswoman um has had her hands on so many different stories um and been additive to all of them it's never been a time that I've seen Lucy and didn't want to see Lucy. Okay. Every time she showed up, I'm like, that's my girl Lucy. Um, and just like from seeing like a little bit of arc to Fort Charles, shout out to PC Rewind, by the way. There's a new podcast um, of Susie, Ray, and Britt, um, friends of the show, and just all around uh, really amazing people who are doing this uh, podcast when they rewatched Port Charles. 
and so because of that, I've like been rewatching a little bit. They do not love Kevin. So that's a little controversial for you, Sandra. I know. I'm aware <laughs> of their stance. Yes. It's okay. But, uh, they have some points. They points are made. I mean, Kevin's a man. Um, and you know, add to the, the comments about our man hate. Um, but um Lucy, like I, I think that it's just like how I am with Amelia from Grey's Anatomy. I'm like, if you didn't watch private practice, I don't want to hear what you have to say about Amelia. I feel like a lot of um Port Charles fans are that way with Lucy. Like, if you don't have, like, if you didn't watch Port Charles, I don't want to hear any negativity about Lucy. Um, and I've really enjoyed watching her on Port Charles and, like, keeping up with the rewind. Oh, my God. Lucy on Port Charles. Ugh. Epic. Just, mm. <laughs> Oh, I do. I need to catch up on the rewind. <laughs> motivating me. Yeah. Oh, I love this energy for Chillin. That's my last hot take. Oh, it's yeah. Like, I love emphasizing BLQ's complete lack of moral compass. Like, she's just, yeah, like, what a, for my, for Bay? I'll lie for you. I mean, I'd lie for less, but I'd certainly lie for you. And Chase just being like, my God, but also like so touched. Chase is like so wholesome. He's like, please don't do that. But he's also like, she will lie. She will lie and scheme for me. This is adorable. And so, like, I just this is what works about them. Keep doing that. But also just let them bang. Yeah. And that's my final world word. <laughs> let these beautiful people get together. But yeah, no, I I have really come around on them. I was really hard on them at first. Um but I really come around on them. Um, and I and I think that having the light moments, like what we saw at the bar um, during the baseball game and stuff like that, like showing them as a real couple or showcasing that like real couple Kim has been what brought me around to them. Saya, do you have any hot takes before we get into previews for the week ahead? No, my anti-Cody take was my only hot take for real. And it was a perfect one. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Sandra, tell us what is going to be happening in the week, in the week ahead. You're never going to say what we have to look forward to ever again. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, let's start us off with what we have with Wiley's adults, which actually with ELQ and uh, being in the state that it is, is like a, a high point really for the storyline. I mean, the highest point was obviously Harmony, but may she rest in peace. So on Monday, Olivia faces off with Nina and Sasha and things take a turn when Willow arrives. Sunny tells Brando and Dex, they have to get along, Dex. This is actual Dex. Actual Dex. This is the an one OG, that funny. Yeah, an OG Dex, which is brilliant. OG Dex, right. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm looking to you all. I'm like, which one is this? I'm so confused. And that was genuine. Okay. Um, Drew warns Valentine. Ooh, I'm shaking. Carly celebrates with Jocelyn and Bobby. Yikes. That will, I'm sure, take a turn. It's like when she was walking in with her hand on her chest when she saw the flowers when somebody was begging Nina. Oh, <laughs> say mine. AKA your favorite moment of last year? Yes, I did love it. It's going to be so painful, but so funny. I'm going to love it. <laughs> Tuesday, an unexpected event surprises those at the Metro Court pool and leads to a revelation. Leo overhears Michael talking about his next move regarding Sunny. Mm -hmm. Nina and Ulbrich discuss their current love lives. Woo! Sorry, Laura Wright. I'm Ooh. getting that fast word, but Red D. And then <laughs> <laughs> on Friday, uh, Drew has a business proposition for Nina. 
And Carly is evasive when she crosses with Sunny. Hmm. So cool, I guess. Um, truck nuts. Isn't oh no, let's talk about Pelomina first. Um, so Pelomina and Deception. <laughs> I love that sentence I just said. Truck nuts. No. Let's talk about Pelomino first. Okay, so on Wednesday, my, Sasha and Michael reconnect. Thursday, Sasha's stress skyrockets before her TV appearance for deception and Felty arrives. That's um, the, the paparazzo uh, that has been trying to supply her with pills. Um, and then Friday, <clears throat> Things don't go as planned as um, Maxi, Lucy, and Sasha arrive for their appearance on the Home and Heart channel. And um, we know that the there will be two guest actresses featured on that, Morgan Fairchild. Um, and, oh, wow. I, oh, the actress's name is escaping me right now, but she played Luna Moody on One Life to Live. She also texted Frank. I don't have as much of a problem with this because she is just coming for a one-off. And I think that's like an appropriate way to use like, you know, to infuse the soap with past soap stars. And I personally loved her character on One Life to Live, so I'm not mad about it. She is an actual vet versus Josh Kelly, who was just like a dude who was on One Life to Live for a couple of years, anyway. So that's um, Pilomina and Deception. Then speaking of that dude who was on One Life to Live for a couple of years, um, there's a couple truck nuts. Uh, spoilers. Uh, Dante's horse friend of Car Call <laughs> Um, Dante and Sam are surprised by a connection of Cody's on Wednesday. And then um, on Friday, Cody enjoys a meal with Dante and Rocco. So an annual Rocco appearance. Who knows what he will look like now and who will we keep be playing him um, until he spots Spinelli. Sure, why not? Um, we also get a little Vanna. On Tuesday, Anna questions Valentine's relationship with Victor. And uh, we get a little epiphany in TJ. TJ also uh, on Tuesday. So TJ supports epiphany in her studies for the MCAT. It takes a village. <laughs> I, I actually really love seeing all these people support epiphany and studying. It's like, not the most substantial storyline at this moment, but it's just like nice to see like nice little friend scenes and seeing them support her. Um, we got a little bit of Chillin this week. On Monday, Chase reveals the news to Brooklyn. And then Thursday, uh, Finn and Gregory counsel Chase. So Chase is on Finn and Gregory prop duty. And then <laughs> VLQ turns to Sunny for help. So we have remembered that Sunny and Brooklyn have a deep relationship, allegedly. And then finally, the sex tape storyline. On Wednesday, Britt takes issue when Spencer seeks Brad's help. Esme flirts with Rory at the Metroport pool. Trina, Curtis, and Marshall strategize about her upcoming court date. On Thursday, Spencer tells Cameron he found a way to help Trina. And Esme comes upon Scott meeting with Ava and Nicholas. Oh. And then finally, Friday, as Spencer and Cameron put their plan in motion at the pool, it goes awry. What we also know from Soap Opera Digest is that Esme is going to blackmail Nicholas to get her Spring Ridge internship back. Um, and then there, 
uh, there wasn't an article about this, but um, there's a picture where it looks like Esme, Spencer, and Joss uh, end up pushed in the pool, end up in the pool together somehow. Um, like Esme and Spencer are like completely dressed, but drenched and Joss has a towel and then Trina is standing behind them and Carly standing in between them, like going off on Esme and Spencer. So that's happening in the mix of all of these um, scenes at the pool, I'm assuming like throughout the week. So we'll finally get some uh, hijinks, some pool, teen pool hijinks which I always enjoyed last summer. Yeah, me too. I love the pool set. And Tanya, that's what I was saying about um, the Soap Opera Digest article with, did you did you get a chance to read it with Marcus? I think that's what it is. Um, where he was talking about Esme and like how um, he respects, like he feels like, I don't know, like he respects it or he feels a way because it means that Esme is like sneaky and Cass and I respect sneakiness. Like it was like a very weird, I was like, no, no, no. Said that Nicholas found it endearing that she was blackmailing him. Yes. I didn't get a chance to read it, but I will after this now. It's, um, I wouldn't say it's illuminating. It's, I honestly feel dumber every time I hear insight, insight from Marcus about this character that he is playing that is allegedly Nicholas Cassidy. Well, you know, I don't want to be crude, but there are times where reading stuff like that is appropriate. <laughs> so may I'll pull it out when I need that kind of entertainment. <laughs> I, I see you. <laughs> I, yeah, I hear you. Sometimes you want to actually shave off some brain cells. Right. <laughs> Or you just need something to pass the time for like, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, y'all, that has been a show for a week. Yes. I will make sure to put those links that Sandra shared in the notes. I will also, oh, we're also, you know, it's a week, a uh, year um, coming up for Nicholas. I shared this before. So we did, uh, we're, we have a kudo board that will close off on the day before his anniversary and then post up the the for the year um for the year anniversary since i gave the psa we have not had any crude messages so thank you for that <laughs> um and i'll make sure that the link that sandra shared and then also the link for the kudo board are in the show notes thanks y'all thanks y'all all right have, have a, a week have the week you deserve to have that sounded like a threat. No. <laughs> I'm hoping there are people out there that deserve a great week. <laughs> Same. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye.